Hello, so good afternoon. Uh, we are going to be talking about reviving 19th and 20th century epistolary conversations, um, but using digitisation. So uh, my name is Helen, and my background is in secondary and further education teaching, uh, but I'm now doing a PhD, and I've just completed my first year. And for the project, I'm working with Digital Humanities, and Graham is <coughs> going to talk about how they've been helping and really developing this project. <coughs> So the project is called Hardy's Correspondence, and it's a collaborative PhD project that works with the University of Exeter and Dorset County Museum. And we're trying to digitise over 4,000 letters that were sent to Thomas Hardy. And they're currently held at Dorset County Museum, but we're working towards making them openly accessible online. What we found in doing this is that um, Hardy's letters, the ones that he sent to people, have already been digitised. They're online, but it's through subscription. So in really creating the other side of this correspondence in digital form, we're looking at ways to make it more accessible and more discoverable. So just briefly, um, some of the key concepts and terms that I guess a lot of people would be familiar with, but maybe not everyone... Um, a lot of the work we're doing in encoding these texts is done using um, TEI, uh, the Text Encoding Initiative. Um, that's an XML schema and set of guidelines for encoding text. Um, it's very extensive. It covers a very, very wide, su wide collection of texts. Um, there are subsets for different types of documents. Um, the, the markup that I use in individual projects depends very much on the research focus. Some people will be interested in particular aspects of documents, and so they will approach the project marking up certain features. Um, I say that very much depends on the research focus. One of the, the first things we'll, we do as part of the TEI project is sit down, discuss the research focus, and um, agree what, what elements of a document we're gonna, a text we're going to mark up. Um, and agree standard ways of doing that because within a single document there, there could be many different ways of marking up the same features so obviously a project that's got more than one person working on it you need to agree on how you're going to approach that um, obviously we're in a linked open data session so I probably don't need to explain that um, ExistDB it's um, the web platform that we're using for, to, to put this content online um, it's an open source native XML database um, and that's what we're using um, to, to make this content available. Um, what data are we interested in and why? Um, one of the, I mean, obviously, the key features with this and I, I guess a lot of similar projects is we're, we're interested in preservation. Um, these, these letters are currently held, as, as Helen said, um, in the Dorset County Museum. Um, a lot of them haven't been out of their boxes for a long time. So th th there's an element of um, checking the current condition of them. Uh, they have been catalogued in the past, um, but there, there are elements that there are documents that have been missed. So we're, we're finding extra documents that perhaps were known about but haven't been catalogued, so weren't accessible to researchers. They wouldn't have found them. Um, Obviously, accessibility by, by digitizing these, putting them online, putting the transcripts online and the marked up transcripts. Um, we're making them more accessible for people to study and research without them to go to the original source. Um, and obviously, it's making it more discoverable. Um, we're aiming to have free open access to that. That's, that's pending kind of agreement, final agreement with the, the, the museum. Um, so that's what we're working towards. Um, just to kind of briefly go through the process that, that we're following. So we're starting off the first stage of the project, obviously digitising them. We've got um, high-resolution cameras using to take photographs of the letters. We're then going through uh, transcribing the text within those letters. Um, that's something at the moment is being done on a fairly small scale within the project um, for, uh, uh, for letters of particular interest. Um, we are hoping in future to bring in a crowd, crowdsourcing element to this project because, as Helen said, there's, there's over 4,000 letters in this, so there's, there's no way as, as within the project we could get all that transcribed. But obviously there's a lot of, there's a big community of interest around Thomas Hardy, so we're hoping there's a lot of potential for, tra uh, for crowdsourcing there. Um, we then go on and, and um, TEI encode that. I don't know if you can see in any detail, but this is the same letter with certain features marked up. So we're looking at um, 
the obviously the date we're marking up place names people's names um, names of um, sort of works of literature that sort of thing that are, that are mentioned and again that sort of that is discussed at the start of the project and agreed and that that's kind of an involving thing as we go through and discover new things um, and then finally this is just an example of how it's looking at the moment it's not it's, it's still in development the, the the web output but that shows you there um, how the the marked up text looks when you've displayed on the web so obviously you've got the mess data appearing at the top you've got links appearing within the the text to to link through to further detail about the people So just to give you an example of how um, this technology and the digitisation is facilitating research interests, uh, we started by looking at two correspondents, Florence Henneker and Thomas Hardy. And Florence Henneker was an English aristocrat. She was a friend to Hardy, but she was also a fellow writer. And we've selected these at the very early stage of the project because both sets of the letters exist in the Hardy archive at Dorset County Museum. But later in the paper, we'll talk about how we can link to separate archives as well. And these two people met in 1893. That's when their correspondence also started. And it carried on for 30, well, almost 30 years. It only ended with Florence's death in 1922. <coughs> but amid a kind of uh, interest, renewed interest in the 1970s in biographical approaches to Hardy. Uh, one side of the correspondence, Hardy's, was published as a single correspondent volume. And it was entitled One Rare Fair Woman, uh, which is a line from his poetry. And for me, that creates and shapes a particular narrative of these, this correspondence. It's the narrative possibly of unrequited love. And when you flick through this published edition, then there is evidence. You can look for it and find it in the early stages, in the 1890s, when they're talking to one another or writing to one another. So, for example, here, um, Hardy's writing in 1893, and he does seem to be very keen to spend time with Henneker, but he's also at pains to cover that up um, and say that it's purely for artistic reasons that he wants to go to a play with her. <laughs> so that's there. <laughs> but for whatever reason, the editors, um, Evelyn Hardy and Frank Pinion, didn't include Henneker's side. Of the, they didn't include her letters. There are fewer, um, so that may have been one of the reasons. But for me, I feel that it possibly silenced Henneker and kind of propelled that particular narrative of a male writer deeply in love with um, somebody who was married and therefore unattainable. And what I'm interested in is saying, well, letters have lots of different topics in them, so surely we can find lots of different narratives um, I also want to restore her voice. So they summarised her letters in the book, just in two pages. And uh, they said that she had this passionate heart and it was drawn towards anti-vivisection and amelioration of animal suffering. But I just think it's so much better for us to understand the intensity of her passion and her interest in something like that by reading her letters. So bringing back her voice and reviving the conversations they were having. So this is one of my favourite quotes, basically, because she's disgusted with um, Prince A of Connaught uh, for opening the new physiological laboratory at Cambridge. And she's looking for some mad woman to burn it down. She's not going to do that herself, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a more radical version will, hopefully. Um, Hardy is a little bit more kind of uh, muted and controlled in his response and it shows how there's that weighing up of their opinions and their decisions. Uh, so I really think there's historical value in looking at what she's saying because um, at that time the kind of animal rights movement was really closely intertwined with uh, first wave feminism. So that's really kind of focus that I think can come out of this. Um, and so... Really, what we need to do is think about how we can bring this um, dialogue out. And um, whereas with more established traditions, it would be to publish an entire correspondence of a single author, 
with digital collections, we've got the opportunity to recreate lots of different epistolary dialogues. And that, therefore, brings out the form and social practice of letter writing. It restores it through creation of a digital open access archive, which allows these new interpretations to come out. And, therefore, I think we will be going to, uh, hopefully, a live demo <laughs> of that. Uh, so just briefly, this slide, again, showing some of the TEI markup, uh, as showing how we've encoded the, the contextual relationship between um, one letter and the subsequent and previous letters in the exchange. Um, within this, as Helen said, um, it's quite unusual in that, that both sides of the conversation are held in the same collection. Um, so that makes this a particularly good example for us to start working on to, to kind of experiment with this idea. Um, but there's no reason at all why if um, other, the other side of the conversation was held in separate collections and was marked up similarly in a suitable way that this backwards and forwards um, kind of correspondence couldn't be reconstructed across separate, separate archives. So just bear with me a second. Uh, so this is um, showing the, the exist DB kind of web output as it exists at the moment. As I say, it's still kind of under development, so uh, there might be a few um, sections that are, aren't quite as they should be. But again, you can see here we've got the, the metadata that's encoded for the letter, the letter itself, and then we've got this series of uh, links that are following through, showing you from one letter to the next. And you can go backwards and forwards through that conversation. And as I say, this particular example we have both sides of the conversation within the same archive, but there's no reason why it couldn't be sort of set up to work across um, different collections. So, obviously this is at the early stages, and um, where you could see the um, encoding, I've been learning the very basics of that, so when you could see little red bits, that's because I'm still in the process of picking up TEI and everything. But I've found that there have been some successes and also some challenges, so I'll start with the successes. Um, in terms of restoring conversations, it involves more than just the two sides of the conversation. There's more to the context. So many of the letters have enclosures. It might be newspaper cuttings, photographs. In one case, there's a 100-year-old leaf from Shelley's grave. Um, that one has stayed with the original letter, and it's quite lovely to be able to see that. But in many cases, they become separated. And so if we're looking at digitization, we can actually start to bring back some of that context, fill the gaps, and make some of those original connections. Um, and we can do that with TEI. So a success has been that, um, it is coming up to quite small, but Hardy said to Henneker in one of his letters that he was enclosing two little poems um, that he, she might like to see. He doesn't say what they are. He doesn't say the names of them. But reading Henneker's reply, she describes them, and she describes one in detail, where she talks about a couple who walked in wind and rain. And from that, we can kind of deduce that it's a poem called Beyond the Last Lamp. For the online reader, then, we can actually link it to a copy of the poem that's um, on a reliable website. Uh, it's one that kind of uh, gives you contextual information as well. So um, in that way, we can restore that context. Where it's been hard to do that is where Hardy, obviously, is a very public um, figure. He's had a lot published in newspapers, and he wrote an open letter uh, for performing animals, and he was saying you know, about the cruelties of that. And that was published in The Times. For Henneker, he cut that out and put it in an envelope with a letter, so she was able to see it. Um, if we're going to look for it, then we actually have to use a uh, university or institutional login. Then it becomes quite straightforward. You can go on to the Times archive. But if we're really in the spirit of kind of open access and um, making this like a street corner university where anybody can find out about it, then we've got to think about ways do we link to the Times um, or is it that we can't restore that part of the context? So that's kind of how the letter would appear if we had access to that, that archive. The other challenge, um, which is really quite uh, 
kind of engaging for me is the heterogeneity of the letter form. So actually, we're going to get lots of different copy, uh, topics coming up in one letter, and we have to be able to kind of highlight that as a real characteristic of the genre. Whereas in the past, you might get um, kind of a catalogue, and it'll have one entry for each letter saying what it's about. We're looking at ways that you can actually use TEI to tease out different narrative threads. So we can encode names of places, of, of people, <coughs> and of Hardy's literary works. We can include places and geolocations, and his fictional places as well. And we can, other, we can include other points of reference within the texts. We're also looking for a greater um, semantic encoding, which would actually help a researcher to understand a letter on a topic-by-topic -topic basis. So that's what we're working towards. And then we'll just talk about how that's going to feed into um, guidelines. So as we're, we're working on a collection of correspondence, um, I mean, as I mentioned before, the, the TEI guidelines are very extensive. They're, they're still being developed, and it's, it's kind of an, an evolution. Um, there's a special interest group around correspondence, so what we're hoping to be able to do is, is feed into that and feed into the TEI guidelines um, on marking up um, correspondence based on our, the challenges and experiences that, um, that we've discovered as part of this project. So one of the, one of the challenges that we've encountered with this um, is this feature is quite common, sort of getting to the end of a, a letter and then running out of space and then adding a little bit more at the top, um, often written vertically like that. Um, that's apparently, I mean, I'm, I'm not the expert on the correspondence, but I understand that's quite common, common practice in the sort of 19th century and, and early 20th century letter writing. Um, so in order to um, encode that in such a way that the letter continues to make sense in terms of the structure of the letter, that has been encoded. So that bit of text actually appears at the foot of the letter there. Um, in the underlying um, XML, that is marked up so to indicate that that bit of text was actually written as part of page one or on page one of the letter. Um, so it's things like that, that that within the project we've had to kind of make decisions on how best to do that um, and that's the kind of thing that we're hoping will feed back into um, via the special interest group into the guidelines so other people facing similar situations in the, in, in the future have got that as a kind of starting point that they, they may wish to use. Um, as Helen said before, we're, we're looking to obviously link into to other sources of data and information that, that are relevant and connect our project with others. Um, in another of the letters, uh, they make reference to the Browning letters, which are already online as a collection. Um, in this particular case, it's, there's no reference to a specific letter, it's, it's the collection as a whole. Um, so by including a link to that um, as, a, as a sort of separate data source, um, it enables the reader of our website to see those letters at the same as um, Hardy and Henneke would have been able to. Um, other ways we're, we're using linked open data, um, obviously within, within uh, the site we've got various people and places mentioned. Um, we're linking through to authority lists to provide data and, um, on those people and places. Um, at the moment, as I say, it's still in development, we're just linking out to those sources. Um, but we are also eventually intending to kind of draw that data in, obviously so it's credited. Um, so we're, we're building on and linking to existing sources of data and archives. Um, the intention with the project, as I mentioned earlier, is to, for it to be openly accessible. Um, we're, we're looking to um, make the data that we're kind of collating for this project available as linked open data. The idea being that future projects that are looking at other collections of letters other, from other archives um, will be able to build links with this. Um, that's obviously enhancing the discoverability of our project and, and be allowing it to be used as a building block for future projects. Where do we um, yeah. need to finish? <laughs> so um, we'll just flick through this slide. Um, 
and just say that this is kind of one of the future projects hypothetically where we could link up with a very separate uh, collection. So we have Lady Hall's uh, letters and um, they, um, in her library in Stourhead there's um, Hardy's. So kind of we can achieve that hopefully and that's what we're looking towards. So just to kind of finish... Uh, there is educational application. We're getting students involved in this as well. It's helping them to um, take on researcher roles, and we can discuss that in more detail if anybody would like to know more about what we're doing with that. Um, you can also contact us. Um, so if you'd like to find out about the project, that's the first link. And the other one is if you just want to talk more about digital humanities. Thank you.